sell fashion through Glamour and Punk in East Los Angeles, Patsy Valdez, and Asco's Instant Mural, and A La Mode. Uh, Chicano, uh, Asco was a Chicano art collective. They were based in East Los Angeles. They were founded in the 1970s by Patsy Valdez, Gronk, Willie Aron, and Harry Gamboa Jr. One of the known associates was Humberto Sandoval. Their collective ideologies, they felt that Aztec symbols and Mexican nationalist iconography used by the then current Chicano movement artists and muralists accurately represented their upbringing as Chicanos in urban communities such as East Los Angeles. This served as their motive for which they deviated from the aforementioned Chicano art and created more avant-garde and abstract pieces, some of which we will explore in the slides to come. Pase Valdez and Asco's Instant Mural. It was made in 1974. Uh, the location was an exterior wall of a liquor store on Whittier Boulevard. Gronk tapes both Pazzi Valdez and associate Humberto Sandoval to the wall. Humberto's left out, which leaves one to focus on Pazzi Valdez. This means that the audience will not focus on Valdez's female take. Her female take consists of Pachuca's look, uh, her clothing, which is a black short shorts, black platform shoes, coiffed hair, and dramatic eye makeup. Also her demeanor. The clothing serves as a counterculture to Chicanas being seen as demure and submissive, counters gender and sexual norms to her demeanor. Her look anticipates the later 1970s look for Chicanas, which is punk and glamour. Self-fashioning through transnational Latina glamour and punk aesthetics. Self-fashioning highlights the intersections of dress and bodily performances and the possibility of these sites in negotiation of gendered and racialized ideologies. Since Valdez was shy when she was young and wild in Asco, she was able to create a visual space to actively negotiate her silence and invincibility. Through her style, without any political means, and instant mirror of Valdez challenged racial and gender hegemony, her punk style appealed to the working class, Chicanos who were racially and economically marginalized because they gave them a feeling of being empowered. Uh, in summary, uh, Patsy Valdez was able to, to negotiate gender ideologies and of domesticity in a racialized domain in both public and private spheres uh, through self-fashioning. This was evident throughout the work that she did with Asco, such as instant mural and other mode. Mexican Muralism, its social educative roles in Latin America and the United States by Schiffer Goldman. Muralism originally was an art of advocacy, but it also had an educative role. This is why they were done in public spaces. Shefford Goldman, however, believes we should always remember that artists are not historians and a historical perspective is necessary when creating public art. She argues that there are new meanings given in new frameworks and uses the influences by Los Tres Grandes, Diego Rivera, Jose Orozco, and Alfredo Siqueiros had on muralists as an example. These three artists had great interest in pre-Columbian past, but they did not agree on how to depict Mexico's indigenous heritage. Rivera idealized Native American civilization before the Spanish conquest. It is obvious in his works like his National Palace mural. He shows ancient civilization almost with no conflict, even though there was within indigenous groups in Mesoamerica. Orozco did not glorify Native Americans like Rivera. Ancient religion, ancient Mesoamericans were cruel, bloodthirsty, and barbaric to him and favored European religion over indigenous because it was less barbaric to him. Secure was not about telling accurate stories of the ancient world. Instead, he used ancient Indian motives as metaphors for contemporary struggles. In one of his paintings, he used a conquered Cuauhtémoc, the last Aztec emperor, conquering the Spanish, and uses him as a symbol for heroic resistance. All three artists depict Mestizaje differently as well. Orozco uses real historical people, while Rivera depicts indigenous women being raped by Spanish sol soldiers. Mur Muralists also challenge the European-oriented historical view on how Europeans first arrived to the Americas. They did not discover anything, and muralists depicted this part of history from the native's per perspective and depicts them as leaders against colonizers and dictators. Both Rivera and Siqueiros were part of the Communist Party and will show this through their art. Rivera even got himself in trouble for painting Lenin at the Rockefeller Center. He refused to cover up, and because of this, it was destroyed. But he still had it done redone in Mexico City. While the arts of Dadaism became huge in Europe, in the Americas, we instead turned inward upon our resources and sought values indigenous to our own. Some parts celebrated negritude while in other parts, nationalism took the form of indigenism tied to social reform. Recovering 
Mexican muralism in the 70s to Chicanos had become a larger recovery of heritage and identity after a century of deculturization by the dominant society. Past Mexican muralist themes were being transformed with new meanings and implications within the context of contemporary Chicano concerns. So my name is Fernando Curiel and I'll be doing political familism towards sexual equality in Chicano families by Maxine Bacazin. The main argument of the reading is that Chicanx families are adopting a new lifestyle that represents different values and demands given by the most dominant individual of the family and is proven through acculturation and family structure, racism, resistance and family, revolution, family structure and women's role, and machismo. Acculturation, to begin with, acculturation and family structure is the process of adopting the cultural traits or social patterns of another group. In regards to acculturation, Chicanx families are often exhibited signs of Americanization by decreasing their identification by allowing the traditional patterns of male figures having the authority along with the division of sexes. In regards to the family structure, the Chicanx families that fall into acculturation shift from being in a substantial section of the population into the urban middle class. So what this means is that families are often changing based on the uh, different lifestyles they're choosing to live by. They're becoming more Americanized, not fully, but are. So now moving on to racism, resistance, and family. So what this section, dis- what this section of the reading discusses is that Chicanx folks are being oppressed and how that affects the changes in familial patterns occurring among Chicanos. Chicanx folks focus on resistance through activism and seek fundamental changes in institutions of dominant society and that control the lives of Chicanos. The movement is revolutionary. So cultural and political resistance is referred to as political familism, which is the activism that gets the whole family to be involved in the movement for liberation. So this goes back to tie into how we are being oppressed by many different issues. Well, us as Chicano folks are being oppressed by many different issues and we have to find ways of resistance and we bring the whole family within the situation. So revolution, family structure and women's role. So women became highly involved in during the movement that allows them to seek change in racial equality. So by becoming involved, they started to begin noticing. They oh, started to begin. They began noticing different patterns of not just racial domination, but also sexual domination. So system of sexual domination. So they will often be oppressed not only by race but also by sex. They became involved in activities during the movement that questioned their the male dominance. So as they move forward, they started to become more involved. Started to get fight for their, their rights as women, and it started to question if the men is truly the more powerful, the po- more powerful sex. So these political activities challenge Chicanx men and women's roles, affecting the structure of the roles played within the Chicanx family. So when the women took charge in the movement, they decided that they wanted to be more, play a higher role within the, within the family, so that kind of threw down the the men's machismo. Where I go into talking about machismo. So the machismo is often associated with irresponsibility, inferiority, and ineptitude. So the male-dominant Chicano family is frequently discussed in terms of the machismo codes. This is attributed to Mexican and Chicano males who try to portray themselves as strong and bold with no signs of weakness. So with machismo, like, I feel like that impacted me the most about the reading because growing up in a family of Mexican Americans, we often have to, we are often taught to, like, you know, be um, manly, be not cry, you know, have a bunch of women. So that's kind of con- conflicting because not many, uh, not many people want to deal with that. And it's a really struggle to kind of, to, like, see that you have to be this man that they want you to be which is kind of not great (laughs) and that's pretty much the end of my my reading but the question that I did have about the reading was specifically like what roles did the members of the family play like what did the father figure play obviously 
what did the mother figure play? What did the brother or sister or anything else? Yeah. So my name is Albino, and I'm gonna be presenting to you uh, the reading Chicano Critical Disco Discourse and Emerging Cultural Practice by Angie Chabram Denarisian. So basically, this week's reading was about Chicano criticism and how it's been portrayed in literature and how it's risen from almost nothing to being uh, this like big concept at high institutions. And so, first of all, uh, what is Chicano criticism? Well, first, it's uh, the way the the way she said it in the the way she said it the importance. Well, first of all, Chicano criticism in literature is like expressing Chicano struggles or even successes uh, through literature, through sophisticated literature. Uh, Angie quotes that the growing significance of the, of the criticism is a widely accepted, highly sought, increasingly specialized domain of intellectual activity that has, that has and is given always to new frontiers. It says, uh, she first begins to talk about how Chicano literature wasn't popular, it wasn't uh, a main concept that schools or institutions wanted to cover. Uh, it was mainly male-oriented, um, but she said throughout the years, throughout the years, uh, it's grown into something big, it's grown into something powerful, and uh, and it has women involved, and she's, she, uh, specifies on the women part because women in Chicanos in Ch Chicanas uh, they weren't always looked e they weren't looked upon equal as men uh, and she says that now that women currently occupy more varied critical roles such as editors authors and reviewers uh, she says that even though women were playing a big role before literature got big, they weren't expressed in the literature. They weren't given credit, and now they're giving credit where credit is due. And she expands on that. And not only does it expand into females, but it also expands into higher institutions. Uh, for example, uh, UC Santa Barbara, UC San Diego, Yale, and the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, those are four main schools that like made Chicana literature, Chicano literature, something big. Uh, for example, uh, UC Santa Barbara contributed to the development of a tradition of historical scholarship that has uh, unearthed many uh, Chicano literary texts. Uh, San Diego uh, is a circle of Budding Mar Marxist, Marxist, which is like a so a social thing. It's like a sociology, uh, like a view point of view kind of, uh, with the works of Eagle Town, James Town, Sanchez, and Vasquez. So she connected. They connected uh, Marx with Chicanos, and that was important. Yale, which is probably the main one. Uh, it started trends, it wrote about trends, it portrayed trends in Chicano literature. And then we have uh, the University of Texas at Austin, which is, uh, they wrote a lot of literary histories that drew from uh, folks, folks or folks or, and cultural st uh, studies, mythology. So uh, they had a lot to contribute to that. Uh, and each one of those schools, uh, they all had big names. They all had uh, people that contributed to the expansion of Chicano literature. For example, you have Norma Alcoron, Jose David Saldivar, Hector Calderon, Juan Bruce Nova, 
All those people attended these schools uh, in Austin, Texas, in Santa Barbara, in La Jolla, in New Haven, Yale. Uh, they all contributed to making literature what it is. Uh, they all wrote about it. They all went into those schools to study Chicanos, and now they're uh, professors, they're teaching, they're writing, they're researching about Chicano literature. Uh, and they also, the the main topic is that you know uh, Chicano literature wasn't always uh, a go to topic. Uh, it was never big. It was never. It was just people expressing themselves. But but now Chicano literature is something that you know higher institutions, more sophisticated individuals they tend to be part of because they know it's growing as a as a topic. She also says that Chicana literature expanded to countries not only in the US but in Mexico, in Germany, in France, and there was one more, I think it was Italy, where Chicanas is like another topic where it's another main school subject you know it's uh it's not just look like oh it's chicano literature you know no it's people actually focus and devote their time to it and this this whole reading just talks about it just gives examples of chicana literature and uh she basically translates their words into something that you know that people can grasp that people can grasp because this text is really complex it's really really sophisticated so at first glance like you're like whoa you're overwhelmed with the vocabulary with the way they use their words but angie she makes it so that basically summarizes everything she gives examples she highlights things from text and uh and she just portrays how Chicano literature has grown over the past, you know, few decades, years, you know. Uh, it, it went from almost nothing to being a full-on uh, topic, being a full-on, you know, uh, subject. And this book, and this, this, this chapter, you know, it just talks about the expansion of Chicano literature. And yeah, that's pretty much it.